Hello again, listeners, and welcome to the second episode of the Deercast. Um, today we have changed up the format slightly, and we have a guest on, an exciting um, deer stalker who is a friend of Tom's, um, who is going to explain a little bit about um, who we've got on today. Yeah, so um, we're very, very lucky. We've got uh, Justin Carter with us today uh, from Shrew Outdoors. Um, I know Justin because he has the uh, unfortunate uh, position of being uh, my go-to taxidermist uh, if I've ever got antlers and skulls and bits and pieces uh, that I need someone to do something with, um, uh, better than me doing it in my pan in the kitchen. Um, so got to know Justin, uh, he's again, he's quite local to us, so uh, stalks in sort of Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire um, and supplies quite a few pubs, restaurants, etc. around here as well. Um, so we thought he'd be a great guest uh, for you guys to, to get to know. Um, as the professionals that we are, we started recording with him and then realised our recording equipment wasn't actually recording. So um, I'm afraid you do miss the first 20, I don't know, 20 seconds or so of, of Justin introducing who he is. Um, he runs a company called Shrew Outdoors, which is primarily um, a sort of deer guiding outfit. Uh, he does also do some, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, antler and skull preparation stuff. Um, Justin sort of got started in, in this world. Uh, he's always been a sort of keen uh, deer stalker and outdoorsman, um, but really got started in it uh, when he started running a um, events business for a local pub and hotel. Uh, when the pub and hotel closed down, his, his wife said to him, well, what, what is it that really sort of um, gets you out of bed in the morning? Uh, what is it you want, want to go on and do? And he said, well, deer stalking. So she very supportingly said, right, well, you better go and make a living out of that then. And uh, that's exactly what he's done. So I hope you guys enjoy him as a guest, uh, enjoy listening to him as a guest, sorry. Um, I, we both had a great time uh, recording this podcast with him. So uh, over to Justin. Sorry about that, guys. As you can probably tell, we are absolute professionals at this uh, and our recording equipment cut out uh, very rudely on Justin, who was just telling us about uh, the scopes he uses and it was just uh, about said someone gave him a, a Swarovski Z6i, did you say? That's correct, yep. Um, and I mounted it, zeroed it, uh, tested it. I, I, I promised faithfully I would test it for six months with an open mind, which I did. Um, and Julie gave it back because I just couldn't get on with it. The crosshairs were too fine. A oh, lovely piece of equipment, don't get me wrong. It just wasn't for me. And I think scopes are a bit like that. Uh, your eyes, you get used to, and your eyes get used to a reticle and a kind of scope and using it in a particular environment. And you can't deviate from that, particularly when you get to my age, you know, when you, when you jump the 50 hurdle. Mm your eyes aren't what they used to be and my eyes are just used to those Schmidt and Bender fixed eight to 56s and, and I absolutely love them. I, I can't rate them enough. Yeah, it's um, good. there's a lot to be said for simplicity, less to go wrong. Well, I kind of agree, yes. Um, there, is a, there is room for technology in this world and it's moving along very quickly. Um, I'm just not moving with it. <laughs> and proud. proud. Well, proud of it, yes. Um, yeah, that, that's... That's how I roll, and I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. yeah. And clients like it as well. Um, you know, clearly defined crosshairs. Um, there's no with things to fiddle with. You know, before they take the shot, it's just like take the shot. Yeah. No so yeah, that, that's yeah. where I am with with glass. So talk. You just mentioned clients. So yeah. when you came back from came back to UK, settled back here. Stalking was a hobby or? It was a hobby because I ran a very successful uh, corporate events and shooting ground locally, um, which then closed, so I decided to move on. Um, and because I had been guiding um, as a hobby, although a small business on the side, it was more a hobby than a, than a job, um, the wife said to me, what are you gonna do then? And I said, well, I really don't know because I've got a diary in front of me that's empty. He said, well, do something you enjoy. Do something you really enjoy and you'll be fine. So that's exactly what I did. You know, I had the aspirations of being a field sports concierge service. Um, you know, thought I might roll into the corporate events as well um, at the same time. So I ran 
guided stalking and corporate events t together for a year or so and the corporate events fell out of favour and I rolled with what I really enjoyed which was stalking and people were kind to appreciate or benefit from me passing on the knowledge I knew which at the time was to a point, I, I know a lot more than I did then now, and, and uh, still the case today, people really appreciate my honesty and what I'm, and what I'm happy to pass on to them, um, and they seem to take it on board, so here we are today, mm. still doing it, and loving it. So it was, it was taking out, as in guiding clients, you obviously then had surplus meat, so you were selling meat, and then how, how did then the trophy, or the taxidermy side of it? Well I always, to, was that I always kept my own heads anyway. It's something I had always had an interest to. I kept my first deer, which I couldn't remember. I could take you to exactly where I shot it, and it was a monk jack. Um, and I had a go at boiling and bleaching it, and it was a complete disaster. But I've still got it today, and I've done some restoration on it, and it looks a lot better than it did. Um, and I kept a few fallow, and I tried and persevered with those, and I, and I went on the internet and I took tips off people and they started to get better and I started to be a lot happy with the results and then people say to you oh do you know a taxidermist because I quite like to keep this it was my first deer oh, well actually I can do that for you ah brilliant and it rolled on from there so and then I wanted a better quality um, shield or a different type of mount or people would say can you can you do this I saw this can, can you do something like this and I wanted to do something a little bit top end so we started to source some really good quality wood and we started to design a few more some pedestals and uh, stuff that was a little bit different that nobody else had got and people felt quite good about that or you've just done this but no one else is ever going to have the same bit of wood or yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel kind of unique yeah and it and it rolled from there and we've got all sorts of different products we now do i do them all myself um and i've got a great client base you you're know. busy oh yeah yeah i'm busy um and people appreciate that don't keep phoning me it's it's one of those businesses where when it's done as you two guys know you know when it's done it's done yeah um and for anyone out there who is waiting on a head from justin just wait when they do arrive they're absolutely pucker e even if you deliver it in velvet and ask justin to to <laughs> yeah. sort to yeah. sort it out for you it it does come back and it does come back and you're like oh wow that's actually pretty good yeah um, there, there are a few people out there that do push the boundaries and what's possible but uh you like never, a challenge? Well, I do like a challenge. <clears throat> I do like a challenge, and uh, you certainly sent me a couple of challenges, Tom, but uh, yeah, I've got a couple in the shed at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of them Work is Work in progress. Yeah. I'm but no, that's how, that's how that came about, and uh, it's something I still enjoy doing. And it's also, you know, I run a half-day training course. Well, it can be a whole day if somebody wants to get down and dirty and get covered in brains as well. Um, all the information you can gain from a head, mm -hmm. you know, about antler growth and the sizing and the age and the, and the you know, tooth eruption and uh, aging by teeth and, you know, the size of the skull and the, and the wear, you know, that's kind of a course in itself. And once people progress and they get past the, they've shot enough deer and they're proficient in their growler and they've done their level of DSC one and they've probably done the DSC two, they want to learn more. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to start finding more for people to learn um, and, do you, and that's great do you think there are more more people out there or there's more of a thirst for knowledge on it than perhaps there was when you were first starting out as in do you think there are more people trying to do DSE 1 and 2 and, and go that bit further or do you think no it's I, I find there's more people that are at the with respect the bottom end of the ladder so there's, there's a big interest in stalking yeah. There's a big interest in doing the level one. There's a less interest in the two. They, they're kind of be the, the people that are a little bit more serious about it um, and want to develop their skills. And they'll go and do some deer management courses as well. They want to shoot more species. Um, they want to book. They want to do the butchery courses that we do. 
they really want to get into that they want to take it home they want to eat it they want to do that whole field to fork thing but they want to do it really well and I tend to find they're the people that have got more time on their hands uh, maybe uh, people that have retired or um, just looking for a real hobby that they can they can get their their brain into and then they start to want to learn everything they want to learn about um, the antlers and the, all the breeding cycles and the different species and different species around the world and they want to go and stalk in different environments they mm. want to go to Scotland they've got this real urge to do it and they'll go and do it you know they want to shoot lowland reds highland reds uh, then they progress to they possibly want to shoot <coughs> um, dare I and I use the term loosely trophies they 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 want to shoot a bronze, a silver, and a gold of something because they know they're few and far between. So they want to do lots more stalking. Um, yeah, there's people out there that really want to a thirst for learning, and there and there's people out there that just want to shoot deer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whether it's to just to shoot deer or whether it's to shoot deer and eat. Um, and do you think that's a challenge for our industry because? If you've got lots of people out there not necessarily wanting to do the training courses, there's a danger that we start to look like a bunch of kind of, I don't know, a amateurs that don't really know what we're doing, or do you think there are enough qualified people out there that actually we, we sort of vaguely to the outside world look, look like professionals? I think to the outside world we look totally unprofessional, if I'm honest. There's no real regulation in deer stalking in this country at all. Yes, we can't as stalkers. We kind of got our own code of ethics. I know, I know, I have, and, I've, and I'm sure you have. Um, yes, we stick to the law rigidly, but we've also got ethics that we just don't break. Mm. Basically, um, I think there's a lot of people out there that don't feel they need any training rightly yeah. or wrongly yeah. that's their yeah. choice I think there's a lot of people out there that do need a lot of training mm. um, but it's not law it's not obligatory you don't have to take your training yes it's sensible to take your DSC1 because I think that's a really good grounding course for anybody is to do your DSC1 you've got the fund fundamental basics to, to go out there and be safe and not not be reckless yeah um, highly recommend the DSC2 as well lots of people don't but I think that is something that maybe just puts you makes people see you as a little bit more professional than recreational if you got your DSC2 I know a lot more landowners are aware of the DSC2 now oh really? You know, yeah, DSC one was always. Have you got your DSC one? Everybody yeah. knew DSC one. It's still there. Yeah. Um, a lot of landowners and other um, property owners didn't necessarily know there was a level two or or any other deer qualifications. Now they do, mm -hmm. and I have been asked for it on more than one occasion when I've taken on new pieces of land and mm -hmm. it stood stood me in good stead, and I've, I've got it because I've got my level two. And did you do it when it was more difficult? Because it used to be three. I it did it. I, I did it about seven years ago. I think when you had to do the three stalks. Yeah, yeah. I Which was, was quite tough, wasn't it? Because you didn't have just. Well, three. I wouldn't. Uh, you, you could, and I wouldn't say it was any tougher than doing one. You still, I was comfortable going into it. That's why I did it. I felt the time was right. Um, I found an assessor, uh, we stalked on my own ground, you know, which was, I think, a bonus for anyone who's doing their level two if you can do it on your own property, it does yep. help. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, but no, like I say, I was comfortable going into it, I was comfortable with my ability. Um, it took me seven stalks to complete because we had a few blanks and what have you for whatever mm -hmm. reason. Yep. Um, and I passed. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I was very pleased to pass and happy days and I went on to become an authorised witness as well because I felt that I've been through it um, I know what the criteria is um, 
and that was the next step for me in, uh, should we say, my professional capacity was um, to become a witness and I could also help people as well get to that level that they were comfortable to go to somebody else to be witness for mm. their level two. So what I do is if somebody asks me to mentor them to level two, I won't witness them as well. I'll pass them on to somebody else because I think that's the right thing oh, to I see. do. Yeah, yeah. simply bias. Yeah. We could, I'll do, a, I'll do a, an assessment with them to a point, but the official assessment, I think it's only right that you go to someone else who's mm-hmm. has never met you and if you pass, you've, you know, there's yeah, no questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right. I'm going to see, yeah. Do you think a lot more people are going to be doing it now that they've made it slightly easier? Or well, I've had a lot more inquiries now. We've only got to do one and not three. Yeah. Um, whether that's for whatever reason because they think it's going to be easier because you've only got one and not three to do, or whether it's easier or they thought they've now got the time to do it because they've only got one to do. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think they're they're trying to make it. They're basically trying to make it um, because I think only about five percent of people who do. DSC one do the DSC two, or they did. I think they're trying to widen that, aren't they, a little bit? Yeah, I think make it a, a bit more. A, a, a don't hold me to the figures, but it's round the, in the ballpark. I think there's about thirty-two thousand people done their DSC one. Yeah, and about six thousand done their DSC two. Okay, okay, it's more than that, more than five percent. Okay, you know, so quite a few. Yeah, there's a there is a big shortfall. Now mm. there is a call for making it obligatory. So once you've done your DSC, what should you have to do your DSC two? Mm. I don't know. Well, well, I was just about to put you on the spot there and say, what's your what's your view on it? Well, I don't think any training in the deer world at the moment should be made obligatory. Um, I think it's personal preference. How much? Do, how serious are you about it, and how far do you want to take yeah. take it? Whether you're a professional or whether you're recreational you know um, only you will know what your first for knowledge is and, and how far you want you want to take it mm. um, I do think maybe at some point some we have got to look at regulations in stalking the way field sports is going in general and maybe we maybe the point's going to have to come where we say we need some form of Certification or I don't know mm, or legal a process that that proves that as a nation we are professional in what we do. Yeah, because mm. a lot of police forces now are saying, aren't they, that you need to do a C one to have a centre fire caliber at all? Like um, I think Devon and Somerset now won't let you have a firearms. Um, well, even back when I got my first application. Um, they wouldn't give me a centre fire first off. The caveat was, once you've done your DSC one, we'll give you a centre fire. Even back oh, really? then, yeah. Mm. So they're still singing the same song now, which right. I agree with. Yeah. It's amazing the difference between some of the police forces, though, because we we've got a friend who was with Sussex, and that's who he w- applied for his firearms with, and they said must have a ment. We'll give you a uh, two seventy. But you must have a mentor, yeah. And you can only use your rifle when you're with that mentor, um, and only once you pass your DSC one, mm-hmm. and once you've done ten stalks or whatever with your mentor, then we'll let you have a sort of license to go out and shoot where you like, basically. Yeah. He then, in the meantime, moved and is now with Gloucestershire. Yeah. And when he moved, they they looked at the paper and were like, "Mentor, what a load of crap!" And they were like. <laughs> Scrap that off and be like, right, here you go, free ticket, go and do what you like. Yeah, well, I, I see, I stopped taking people on mentor schemes quite a lot of years ago um, because firearms officers were coming to me and saying, I'm only giving him a sense fire rifle if you take him on a mentor scheme. When you're happy that he's safe and he can go out on his own and into the big wide world, you send us a letter and sign him off. Mm. And I wasn't comfortable. No. I, it no. was fine. I, in the early days, it was fine and there was never a problem. And then yeah. all of a sudden, I woke up and I thought, actually, if something goes wrong here and I've yeah. signed him off, um, yeah. so I, I've stopped doing it now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not yeah. surprised. No. Because it's the potential on. there to put you in a very awkward position. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. When I'm, I'm guessing like, if you take 
take someone, take a client out or take someone out and you were mentoring them and you, I don't know, you meet them 10 times and it's 10 evenings or 10 mornings or whatever and that's over the course of a year or two years, you probably don't get to know them massively well in terms of you, you know them to some degree but at the same time you, you wouldn't know them well enough to be like, yeah, I can absolutely hand on heart say they are a good egg and they're not going to do anything. No, so exactly. Well. I can only take as I find and the time yeah. I spend with them is the time that, that's the only time I can vouch for, um, which would be a, a, a tiny amount of time. So, yeah, yeah to, to vouch for any other side of their life or what they do when they're not with me is, yeah. you know, that's why I stopped doing them because hmm. it, it was just unwise. Now, I will still mentor people now, but I won't, I won't make any signing off letters that I consider them to be confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Yeah, which is foolish. Absolutely. So, talking about regulation and controversial subjects, and this is bound to come up sooner or later when you put three deer stalkers in a room together. Mm. Cop- copper ammunition, or, or lead-free, should I say. Yeah. Are, you, are you on the lead-free train yet? Are you not on the lead-free train? What's your, what's your view? I decided last September I was going to try on lead free for six months through a two four three just just to start with that that was my that was what I'd set my heart on. I couldn't get any bullets for a two four three. I started looking into it, so I uh, very quickly I decided to can the idea. Hmm. So I'm not against it, but I'm hundred percent still lead. Yeah. Um, in both my rifles. Um, did you think about trying it in the... Because you're, sorry, you're 2506 and 243. Yeah. Yeah. So did you try... With, I suppose actually with 2506, there probably just wasn't any, was there? Uh, I didn't even look into it because my theory behind it was um, if I'm taking people out and I'm doing training um, and I need an all-round go-to rifle, um, which I'm comfortable with, it s- seemed like the the way forward was to start with the 243. Yeah. Um and then everybody I took out was shooting lead free. We were kind of on the lead free roll. We were we were doing. I was going to sell it as we were doing the trials over a six month period. Anyway, I couldn't I couldn't find any lead free. Nobody was really coming up with any with any sensible information about it. So I decided I'm just going to stick with lead. Hmm. Um, let everybody do the investigation, and there was all sorts of. Um, uh, different sides of the story people were trying this you know people were in love with it people hated it um i'm not even sat on the fence i'm just one side of the fence and i'm the lead side of the fence at the moment um i've i've never been asked about how my deer have been shot i've never been asked by a game dealer although i rarely use them Hmm. if i've been shot if my deer have been shot with lead or lead free i see no reason to move to lead free at all at the moment how, how are most of your deer shot are they are you mostly head neck or are you chest or are you uh, I, I'm head and neck uh, myself personally if I can but that's not set in stone it's ethical um, I'm comfortable head and neck shooting um, I'm also very comfortable body shooting um, so what no, nobody else that stalks with me shoots head and neck it's all it's all body um, and it's all body shot with lead process all my own venison um, it goes through um, an in-field inspection it goes in, it gets inspected again uh, when it's in the chiller it gets inspected again when it's skinned it gets inspected again before it goes on the block uh, we, we cut out everything we feel is necessary and to date, thankfully, we've we've never had an issue, and we've never been even ever, as true as I sit here, been asked how what we shoot our deer with. Hmm. So, would you be tempted to try lead free again, or are you just sort of actually no? I'd be more than happy. If, if, more than happy if someone came up with a, a um, lead free round for, let's say, my twenty five oh six. Um, and really wanted to get to grips with it and do a trial, I'd be more than happy to take it on. But I will say this, I have seen animals, small, medium and large, shot with lead free. And I've had 
very odd reactions. Although we've never lost a deer, mm. I do probably goes back to old school again. You know, you, I'd like to see the reaction, and I and I'm comfortable with the reactions I get with lead. I kind of know where I yeah. am with it. Yeah, yeah, you've done so. Long I get some yeah. really odd reactions with lead free. Is that through clients who come out with lead free ammunition? Yeah, basically with all sorts of different calibers. Oh, really? Um, I can totally sympathise with that because the I used to use 150 grain Sierra Game King lead bullets, and you always got in a 308, and you always got a really good sort of thwack. Yeah. Mm. You like because the kick of the rifle, you 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 have you aren't still watching that deer necessarily, so even if the scope kind of flicks off it, you could tell by the thwack you were like, well yeah. I've got that. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the copper stuff it is the one criticism I would have of it is that sometimes it can hit a deer and you, for all you know it's hit the dirt next to it it, it doesn't have that same kind of whack mm. noise to it it'll still, like if it hits it'll still you'll, you'll hear a noise but you don't have I don't have maybe I'll get used to it but well that's what I was just going to say isn't, isn't this all that this is all to the majority of stalkers um, this copper lead free is it's a new thing mm. There's, there's a lot of people out there I know been shooting copper for, for many, many years or lead free for many, many years. They probably got used to the reactions and how it works and what, and what to expect. Yeah. You know, it, it's new to me. You know, I've only really experienced it for the last couple of years. Mm. You see people shoot there with yeah. like copper really is mm -hmm. the, what they've been shooting with. Um, and I just don't know just haven't got used to the reactions enough yet. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, I suppose no one's really used them for more than, what, two years, realistically, on deer, in the sort of, like, the commercially available yeah. ones, and so yeah, I mean, you're not going to know. Really, I've heard of really. people been self-loading for 15 years, gone lead-free. I know the Forest oh, really? Commission flipped to lead-free, I don't really know how, how many years ago, but I know they're... So they've been lead free for a while. Yeah, they? they've been quite a, quite a while. They've been lead free, so mm. they're probably growing with it and they're getting yeah, used right. to the expectations of the different distances and different deer and yeah. kind of what to expect. Yeah. Um, v visually, I don't think there's any difference. If you hit a deer in the chest, it will still react visually in the same well, way. Well, I disagree with that because I have someone with a two seventy with a hundred and fifty grade bullet shot a fallow cricket at 120 yards on Thursday I was glassing it he shot it from the high seat and I went you missed that and he went yeah, I did and he was shooting as well he said no I missed that completely oh, really? absolutely no reaction it didn't really? the, no the, 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 the uh, reaction nothing the, the shot everything said a miss it ran 30 yards and it, and it dropped dead in the ditch really yeah and when we went and had a look at it the heart was in two bits bloody hell yeah let me grab a tip and, and uh, true as I sit here there was no absolutely no reaction at all see touch really? wood I've never had that I've had if you if you hit it you hit it and it, if you've still got a sight picture on it which again is one of the reasons I've gone to a lighter bullet so you can maintain that sight picture yeah then I've, I've always been able to tell, but you just, the noise-wise <coughs> is totally different, I'd say. And then I had somebody out on exactly the same day who shot two prickets with a 6.555 lead-free, and the reaction was, was if it was with lead. Mm. So it's just, it's just odd, and I don't know enough about it, and it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, and I do appreciate probably sooner rather than later I am going to have to jump to the other side of the fence and I, and I know that Yeah, I'm just kind of holding off until I have to but it makes sense to wait for everyone else to make all the mistakes and you know it, the, it come down in price a lot because I think that's a lot of people's aversion yeah. to it that it is literally double the price in a lot of cases mm. of lead free stuff and it's hard oh, enough okay. to find yeah, but why, do, why do people moan sense. about the price because um, I had this conversation with someone the other day. Is like whatever it costs you, if it's three pound a bullet, do these people that moan about the cost of bullets, uh, all they're doing is just punching targets and shoot a few deer? You know, if you're a professional deer manager and shooting two hundred, three hundred, four hundred deer a year, does three pound a 
carcass really make a difference. No, yeah, that's a fair point. I suppose it's sort I, of like your hobby stalkers who maybe go out and do ten. You know, you know I'm not zero, point, I'm not pointing the finger, yeah. but um, no. you know, I I have seen it where people have wasted boxes of ammo to get yeah. a zero, and I'm like, yeah. neither. You either need one or three or maybe five bullets to to do a zero on on a rifle. I, I suppose people just get used to it, don't they? And like, well, I'm, as human nature, we all love having something to moan about, don't you? So like, if, if you've been oh, used. Yeah. If you've been used to paying a pound a bullet and then all of a sudden your local gun dealer spits up to two pounds or two pounds fifty, you, mm. you think, what an absolute... Well, we all notice a price change, don't we? Yeah, of course yeah. we do. Exactly. So I, that's probably what it... You're right, actually, thinking about it, in that it doesn't, like, to the economics of deer stalking, it doesn't mm. really make any difference, but no. human nature, you notice it and therefore you complain about it, yeah. don't you? And don't get me wrong, I'm not rolling in money, but if I go to buy bullets, I normally buy a batch of 100. And I just go, oh, can I have a hundred of those, which is normally exactly the same bullet as I always buy. Yeah. And we, bang, and I just pay for them. And I and I probably go out and sit in the truck and go, oh, they were two quid more than I paid last time, or mm. they've gone yeah. up a fiver. Yeah. I need them. Yeah. You know. And what is it you're you're shooting with at the minute in in the calibers? What bullets? What bullets? Uh, so I'm shooting lead, 117 grain Seiko bullets. Yeah. Game head, game heads yeah. in the twenty five oh six, and I'm shooting the Seiko game heads, hundred grains in the two four three. Yeah. Lovely tight group. I used to shoot Federal, and I couldn't get any once, so I, I picked up a couple of boxes of those Seiko, and they group even better. So I've stuck with those. They're yeah. fantastic bullets. Yeah, I used to really say like in the, the twenty five oh six, and they just cloak yeah. it for a hundred yards. They just seem to love love my sour. Mm. Yeah. It's a great stick with it. Why change? Yeah. Why the uh, why the sour over the sort of your teakers or you know Remingtons or whatever? No, I I saw I saw a sour quite a few years ago, and I, I will say this as well. I'm all wood. I, if you handed me no, a, really? if you handed me a synthetic rifle, I'd give it you back. I'd say that's very nice, thank you, because I can't. I don't like the feel of it. I don't. I just don't like synthetic okay. so all my rifles all my shotguns are, are wood and I saw one one day and I picked it up and the, and the thing that drew me to it was the safety mechanism mm. on the 202 and I think the 200s are slightly different um, but it's the um, under trigger guard um, flick up flick down so it's, it's not okay. on the it's not on the um, so it's stock it's under trigger guard is, is it on the so it's on it's on the top of the stock yeah it's a button oh so by your thumb yeah oh is it the rolly uh, wheel type of thing no, no. It's, it's just a, it's an up and down button so you, you press it down um, and then to, to make it live you just flick it up with your trigger finger oh. so you've got oh, full okay. grip on your rifle and you just yeah. flick it up with your finger it's, it's virtually silent um, you don't need to use your thumb or anything yeah. and I, I kind of like that and I thought I actually really like that yeah and then I looked at it and it's like, oh, that's a sour. Oh, that's a sour two and two. What's a sour two? And oh, they don't make those anymore. Anyway, I looked for one. Happened to find one second hand in twenty five or six, um, and got on with it. An absolute dream. Um, it's got a nice thick grip on it. I've got big hands. It just just fits yeah. me. Yeah. yeah. Fits they got a lovely nicely. action, nice and smooth. Like nice and smooth. Yeah. Everything about it was just was just nice. Yeah. Very um, good. Well, I've just got the uh, the 404 a couple of months ago, and yeah. I have to say my one slight criticism that is the the safety. Right. So it's got one of those like the like the Blas or R8 ones do. You oh, know the yeah, decocker. Yeah. yeah. So you have to push. You have to actually push quite hard to get it off. Yeah. And it sound, doesn't sound like you know that would be a big deal, but when you you know when you're quickly trying to snap shot a fat or something like that. Yeah, trying to push yeah, this and thing I've forward. had quite a few people over the years with blasters and similar safeties. They mm. even some people have had to do it with two hands because it's so heavy. Yeah, they're stiff. I'm um, I'm so glad you said that because I went to a rifle range a few years ago, and he has blasters as his range rifles, mm. and I, I I was made to feel like a real idiot because I was using it and I just for the life of me couldn't get the safety catch off, and. Yeah. I, I just, it just, I don't know. It just didn't feel intuitive. There was just something about it that it just didn't work for me at all. So I'm glad to hear someone else said the same. But then again, it's what you get used to, isn't it? It's yeah, like generally. anything. You know, your tools are your tools. Um, you know, your tools aren't going to work for me necessarily, and vice versa. 
Um, I just love simplicity, and that, 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 like I say, that's what drew me to it. Um, and I went out and bought another one back in the summer, swapped out my 243 on a 141, yep. and bought an identical rifle, mm -hmm. had the triggers all set and everything, yep. and I just love it. Yeah, it's I had, I know why, you d I mean, if I could do that, I would definitely, because I had that same problem where you have two different rifles, and you've mm. been out with one the day before, and you go back to the other one, and they got different trigger weights. Yeah. And you go to pull what you think is a, a heavy trigger, and it just, you know. Yeah, and I have mine set on a heavy trigger as well. Mine are, all like, mine are both on 3.8, because I just like to feel oh, the really? squeeze. Yeah. Both, I've got a hair trigger on both mines, I'll never touch it. It scares me to death. Really? Yeah, even if I'm in a seat and I've got all the time in the world, I won't put that hair trigger on. Because it's just, I don't feel comfortable with it. I like I like that I like that nice strong squeeze, and then then it's like clicking the mouse on the last bit. Great. That's really interesting. Simple. Because I think we're probably both the other end. I mean, I'm I like You're basically as light as possible, um, for whatever reason. I think mainly because I don't know. Maybe I don't have a very good technique. But when I have a heavy trigger, I tend to pull the stock to one side. Um, which right. obviously I always end up shooting about an inch to the right if I've got a heavy trigger. But it all triggers are different as well. You know, those, those sours, are, are, I've got it set heavy, mm. but it's just crisp. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm personal it. preference. Yeah, it is, isn't it? I'm currently debating whether I swap my single stage trigger out for a two stage trigger. I'm hoping you guys are going to persuade me not to and not spend money. I'm not going to persuade you to do anything, Tom. You're an adult. Oh, Justin, come on, <laughs> help me. Because um, I, my shooting, I, I started with an air gun, a spring, spring yeah. air gun, and they're all two stage triggers. Yeah. So then when I moved to centre fires, and they're by and large, or most of the ones that I've shot with single stage triggers. Yeah. I, it just, I don't know. It almost feels like. Hmm. One of you's going to make a joke here, but when the gun goes off, it feels premature. You're a bit like, whoa. Yeah. Didn't, like wasn't ready for that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I don't know. So, I think it's got something quite nice about being slightly surprised by a shot. Yeah. When you pull the trigger, you you, you know that the crosshair is exactly where you need it to be, but it kind of you know you're not quite anticipating it going off in that sense. That's how I like to shoot anyway. Not. Yeah. You know, there mustn't be there mustn't be any anticipation because yeah. that's where a fringe comes in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it does sort of surprise you. And that's probably why I like a lighter trigger. Yeah. But I've had the two-stage Timmy trigger on the Tika and hated it. Did you? Yeah. For what reason? It was just... If you, if you need to make a quick shot, you don't really have the time to kind of think about taking up that one stage and then you, you kind of get there. It just felt like overcomplicating it, in a way. Yeah, and I don't like overcomplicated. No. So don't get one. <laughs> Great, you thank you guys. Decision made. There we go. Call it a night. <laughs> I've saved myself 200 quid or how much they are. Yeah. yeah. So this could be, a, I'm just going to throw this in there while we're talking about rifles. This could be quite a hot topic for discussion about um, moderators. So break down moderators or not break down moderators. Do you like to clean your moderator? Do you never clean it? Do you, what do you do with your moderator? It's a very good, it's a very hot topic, isn't it? I I think we both like to take them apart and basically scrub them every like six months. Mm -hmm. I'm just, kind of with you on that. I like to keep mine clean because I don't like it full of soot. No, um, I've heard so many different stories about what you use to clean them with WD forty oil, yeah, uh, grease. That I think. In, even if you go into a gun shop, they won't commit. They'll say, well, it's personal preference. Yeah, and yeah. I've been into gun shops and they'll say, well, why do you even want to clean your moderator? Yeah. What do you want to clean your moderator yeah. for? Yeah, yeah. I feel comfortable with keeping my moderator clean. Yeah. I've never had breakdown moderators until recently and I swapped both mine out for a stripped down one. Which uh, one have you got? I've got, I've got the Freya and the Vic ones. Oh, have you? I was looking Which I think are absolutely fantastic. Um, oh, interesting. They're quiet, they're light. And you can clean them, which is great. Is cleaning that the? Stuff, um, I feel comfortable cleaning stuff. Is I'm it the one nine six one, or is it the? Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I've got the two different weights. I've got the one nine six, and then the two six something or other. Oh, okay. So one's slightly longer than the other, and one slightly heavier than the other, but they're still light. Oh, uh, that's what I was going to get for my sour actually, the one nine six. So I'm glad they're quite good. Well, I've got one on my sour. Yeah, they're. I, I can't. 
I can't knock them. No, no, they can't. I was just about to ask if you're moderating cleaning match your rifle in terms of you like things to be clean and spick and span or I'm the kind of guy who goes out stalking and I, I, I use a ball snake yeah roughly 10 shots give or take I just run the ball snake for it once maybe twice as long as the barrel looks nice and shiny that's cool moderator I might strip it down when I feel like it that might be once every three months and that'll be it won't be uh, scrub it till it's spotlessly clean yeah. just be get some of the carbon out yeah. you know spray some WD-40 mm-hmm. on it give it a nice clean yeah. I feel comfortable with that yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. good if you just get it sooted up forever and ever yeah, and ever and then the rifles would get a birthday every six months with a proper rub through yeah um, four end and stuff will come off just to make sure there's no rust in there from rain and bits and pieces uh, and then once a year the whole barrel will come off the headspace and everything will get a proper good throw or clean out and, and that's me you know. do you find any um, using wooden rifles all through the year do you ever find any sort of movement in the zero or anything with wet or damp or no really no I Is might that... have to I might have to do one click here or there on the odd occasion mm. but that's it right I'm you got it's, it's it's all to do with a good quality scope and my scopes are five hundred. You can buy them for five hundred quid, and I've had them for years. Yeah, a good set of mounts, good quality set of mounts. Um, make sure they're tight, even if you have to glue them in. Once they're on the rifle, leave them on the rifle. I don't go for these flip off scopes or anything like that. It's just once my rifle is set up, that's how it stays until it gets sold. Yeah, yeah, which is rarely. Yeah, no, I'm once with you on the once on it's the shot mounts. out, it'll go, and that and that's it. My um, sour came with one of those um, flip off, flip on mounts, and I did it a couple of times. But since I've zeroed it, I don't take it off. Well, a lot of these, know, a lot of these, um, I think the blasters guarantee that it's a flip off, flip on, and it's it's just, it's zeroed yeah. or, or barrel changes and stuff like that. You know. That's what they say. You can take the you can take the barrels out interchangeably, and it'll still be. It just still makes be me just, nervous. Yeah, I mean, it makes me nervous. Like, around, I, I, we're going back to simplicity again and comfortable with what you know. You know, and I, like I just said, I will set up a rifle. Once it's on, it's on, and that's it. And it's and I know exactly where I am with it all the time. I know if I'm. I know if I put it on a hundred yards and I do a zero, and it's and it, it's half an inch left. I've got one or two clicks, or if I want to be an inch high, and and that's it. I don't need to shoot it again because I know it will be where I put it. Mm. Yep. Keep it simple. Mm. So if you're shooting a deer at say 200, 250 yards, you just yep. you just hold a couple of inches. You never do. Yeah, any they're set on, so I just hold over. I know I know exactly where I'm going to be. Hold over, bang. That's yep. it. And it's straightforward. Don't use a range finder. Don't use thermal. Don't use anything. It's That's going to be my next question. You n- you haven't haven't used a the thermal at all. Um, I've I've tried the hand. I've tried clients' handhelds and can't get on with them just because it's new to me. Um, I've never purchased one and had it long enough to play with it and get comfortable with it. I, I appreciate they've got a purpose, but I've got. I mean, I've got a brilliant set of binoculars. I mean, I can. I can virtually see in the dark I, I, I really don't think I what need what are them. these binoculars <laughs> people want to know I really don't think I need a thermal yes they yes and I have considered with going forward and the popularity of um, thermal that I probably need to require one to be training people on one yeah, but great for follow up great for deer assessments yeah. uh, you know use it for, for its purpose and it and it's got a beneficial purpose, obviously, because they're so popular. Um, and I am seriously considering buying one for that reason. Because uh, most most people who do guided stalking, in my understanding, use them at the minute. Yeah. For what? In I my th- opinion, you, you find hundreds of deer that aren't shootable. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. What, in all seriousness, what binoculars are you using, Justin? Because people are going to want to know. Yes. If you can see in the dark with these things, you come on. That's a bit of an exaggeration, <laughs> but they are absolutely fantastic. They're the Opto. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mioc are eight, eight by fifty six. They're Mio Pro, I believe they are. Yeah. And I absolutely, they, they're not spots of any other set of binoculars I've ever looked through. Really? Uh, yeah, I genuinely believe it. Yeah. And I'm and I'm not getting paid by Mioc to say that. No. You know, I've looked through Sarovsky scopes, Zeiss scopes, and in my opinion, they're brilliant. But again, it's what you get used to, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, you know, I've got people that pick my binos up and go, "I oh, can't, oh, can't look through yeah. them." Can't yeah. look, look, look. Everyone's eyes are a bit different, aren't they? So yeah, of course they are. Everyone's eyes are different. You know, my eyes have probably got used to those binos over the years. Yeah. I don't know. And that's eight by fifty-six. Everything I've got is fifty-six. I, I think any. Uh, I don't understand why people will buy anything less than fifty-six for stalking. If I'm honest. Mm, really? Yeah. Okay. But that's my opinion. You know, get as much light as you can in there. Mm, if they yeah. bought out 65 mil, I'd be buying it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> you're lugging them around yeah. over your shoulder. Yeah. So what you're saying is I don't need to get a Timley trigger, but I do need to upgrade my scope to a 56 mil scope now. I think you do. I'm not yeah. telling you to do anything, well, Tom. You you're an did. adult. But <laughs> I would highly recommend, if anybody ever asked for my opinion, I would say mm. you've got to go to 56. So if... It, Here's a question for you. If you if I was a, a complete novice stalker, yeah, wanted to go out and shoot my first fallow buck in velvet just to annoy my taxidermist, yeah. I didn't didn't have a rifle or, or any of the, the gubbins yet, and I came to you and I said, What should I buy? Yeah. What including like caliber, rifle choice, scope, mounts, ev- mod, everything. What what would your advice be? I'd say go and buy a, a, a two four three. Yeah. A, any 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 manufacturer is, is your choice. Just be yeah. comfortable with the the safety catchings and workings of the rifle. Uh, moderator again is choice, but I would recommend a strip bound moderator. Yeah. Um, I would I would recommend fifty six mil scope. Um, I would recommend Schmidt and Bender because I've used them for long enough. But again, it's personal choice. If someone wanted to spend more, um, that's entirely up to them. But don't spend any less than five hundred quid. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's not. I know like everybody says whatever you pay for your rifle, spend half again or double yeah. on on a set of scopes, yeah. and that's good advice. Mm. Um, but I can only talk from experience. Yeah. So I, I'd say go and buy um, a Schmidt and Bender, but probably buy the version with the red dot on. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I have shot. I have got some um, Carlos scopes which have got red dot on, um, and they are beneficial. Yeah. In low light. Um, yeah. And for someone getting into it, I'd go. All, I'd say we'll go and buy a red dot from the start anyway. Yeah. Because that's what you did, wasn't it, Tom? You bought. Uh, you got a Schmidt. Or is it three, three to twelve by fifty two? Yeah, I'd say it's just it, it's the classic range or line of Schmidt and Bender scope. So it's it's their like sort of basic range in inverted commas. I think what you actually get is something with very little kind of flashy bits on it. Like yeah. it's not a kind of tactical yeah. scope with mill dot reticle and all this kind of stuff on it. But what you get is just really good quality mm. glass. And it um, so yeah, it has a um, uh, it doesn't have adjustable parallax, but it has a, a adjustable illuminated reticle. I think like ten different settings on it. Yeah, and it, it for me was game changing because yeah. I'd, I'd had a I'd had one of the cheaper Zeiss scopes before, and it was one of those ones that I, I don't know. It was I think it was about five hundred quid or something, but it was from it was a Zeiss scope but made in China. Um, and it was great in daylight, but as soon as you got it into low light, it just fell apart basically. Mm. Um, whereas now with this Schmidt Bender, it's it's a hell of a lot better. Yeah. And having that illuminated reticle does just mean. Yeah. I said, well, Saturday night when we were out, fallow cricket came out. It was a bit dark. Fallow cricket itself was dark coloured. Crosshairs were dark, and I knew if I wound up the magnification, the sight picture would go blur, and I wouldn't be able to see what I was looking at, so I had to have a relatively low mag, but yeah. with that little red dot, I was able to go, right, stick that on the shoulder, jobs are good, and away we go. Yeah, hence, uh, if someone was starting fresh, go and get a red yeah. dot, certainly be beneficial, yeah. Um, yeah. with a relative lack of experience, Yeah, 100%. Yeah, spray down moderator that you could keep relatively clean, um, and a, and a, as 
binoculars because you spend so much time on them as mm. much as you can afford but go 56 find find the 56 mil mm -hmm. set mm. yeah in my opinion and are you shooting off tripods quad sticks single quad sticks, sticks quad sticks you used to shoot off uh two single sticks um and then someone showed me the viper pet the viper pet uh, viper flex quad sticks never be without them yeah wherever my rifle goes there you go if I go to a high seat whatever I do those sticks go with me yeah I think we're we're both the same but oh, we've okay. we've both done the got the fifth leg on it as well I don't know okay I don't yeah no I was yet. with someone this week who got the fifth leg um, and certainly extremely stable yeah although, it's, it's he, although he did um, dawdle a bit on a deer trying to get the fifth leg in position that is yeah, very yeah, stable yeah once you get up to speed with it and you get used to it it's, yeah, yeah but it's just so good yeah. and I, I think you've got to be prepared not necessarily to use it every time yeah which i've definitely gone to the danger of is because i know how stable i am with it yeah. every deer i see i'm like well i must get that fifth <laughs> leg out <laughs> yeah, yeah. but actually like sometimes you're just like well hang on a minute yeah. i survived for three years four years before i had this fifth leg like you don't need it but yeah but if you want, if you've got all the time in the world and you want to head shoot something, the fifth leg is just. Absolutely I will say though, I do prefer the old Viper Flex stick that have got the physical stuff on them and not the new ones that you can open to um, 180 degrees. Yeah. Because yeah, when I set my sticks up, yeah, and uh, I know I'm, when I set them up, I know if I put them at full spread, their maximum spread they're going to be exactly the same height all the time for me, ready yeah. to roll. Yeah. And trying to teach newcomers to use a stick that potentially every time they deploy it is never going to be the same height is actually quite frustrating. Yeah, yeah. yeah I can imagine. Because I, I recently upgraded to some Viflex ones and they have got that kind of hand guard and you've got to be quite disciplined with yourself that if you use that hand guard, it will make sure it opens it to the same width yeah, if but I, I mean, I'm, quite, I'm quite strong, and I, I do struggle to squeeze that. I've tried for the new ones to actually physically squeeze it to get it to open in some yeah, situations. Yeah. yeah Whereas my sticks before, well, by the sounds of things, like the old Viperflex ones, that they would only the legs would only come apart to a certain yeah. amount. So therefore, I mm. always knew, as you just described, you'd be like, right, whoop, get them out as wide as they go, bosh, Boom, that's it, on. same height every time. Yeah, jobs good. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Because there's nothing worse than watching someone go to take a shot when they're bent over, yeah, and that the sticks are too low, yeah, completely ruins your whole, yeah, your whole yeah, setup. It, yeah, does your whole stance and everything. It's that, it's that stability I feel you lose mm -hmm. if your sticks are too short. Yeah. So yeah, again for me, recommendation: go and get yourself a pair of old Viperflex sticks, yeah, yeah, or buy a new set of Viperflex sticks and put a bit of string across them so that once you yeah, get yeah. them set up, they're only open to a certain distance. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea, actually. That's a good idea. Yeah. And um, do you shoot off a bipod very much? Do you have a particular? Uh, I I don't take many shots of bipod, but I, I I always have it with me in my kit bag, uh, and I use the. Um, Oh, what are they called the Spartan? Oh, you do magnetic one, yeah. yeah so yeah. both my rifles have got the magnetic attachment on it. Uh, not good for Scotland hill stalking, but if you've got all the time in the world and you're in a nice spot and you want to set up on a bipod, out the kit bag, quick, it's quick and easy. Yeah, I've got two different um, sizes of legs, so for the summer I put the longer legs in for the longer grass. This yeah. time of the year I've got the the shorter set. Interesting. Um, because I'm going up on the hill next week what would you recommend bipod wise for that or uh, buy a fixed one and I forget the name of them what's the traditional like Harris, a Harris a Harris bipod like the long long leg ones just get just get yourself a Harris bipod yeah yeah. I find it very difficult trying to turn around and reset yourself on mm. those um, uh, the Spartan ones that I've got because yeah. the leg keeps to always close and you know I find yeah, up, yeah, in, up in the hill with a uh, Harris fixed bipod you just lift it up and move it lift it up and move it it's, it's, it's there it's easy yeah, nice and yeah that's true yeah. and I don't like stalking with a bipod attached to the rifle anyway so yeah you know I find it very difficult well I used to find it very difficult stalking with a Harris bipod attached so I took it off yeah. and that's why I flipped to the Spartan method yeah I have to say since I've started using quad sticks I've barely used the bipod yeah you just don't yeah unless you're kind of summer and everything's really low and you want to yeah, take yeah. a nice stable shot but with I the fifth leg i don't think you really need them anymore 
Well, no, I don't it's think a problem with ground beer, to be honest. To no, we just about to say exactly the same thing. Like, you, it's rare, for me anyway, that you're out stalking somewhere mm. and you've either got a, a decent enough rising backstop, yeah. normally you've got like a deer and what I'd call, call a sort of deer behind it, basically, in terms of there's enough ground. Yeah, you're safe, but. You're safe, yeah. but if you got down on a bipod, that deer would have a house behind it, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's nice to have in your kit bag to be used as and when. Yeah, definitely. Keeping on the sort of kits, what uh, what knives are you using for your granicking? Are you on the sort of very high end stuff like like Tom's just invested? No, in not at all. I've got a friend of mine in Austria who makes knives, so I've got one of his um, okay. Balletta, Balletta knives, yeah. um, which is my stalking. Oh, I've got two knives that I have on my belt for stalking, so to bleed and do a field gralic. Um which are not expensive knives, 350 quid I think is the most I've ever paid for a, for a knife. Um, but what I have got, which I purchased not very long ago from Deer Central, if I could make a plug, is a set of butcher's knives in a white sheath. Um, you've got two boning knives um, and a steak knife and a steel. I've taken to using those, particularly on the fallow, because I like to do a hanging grout on the fallow. Mm -hmm. um, I've taken to using those. Um, so I just put the whole sheath on my belt, um, mm -hmm. steel attached, and uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And that's from Deer Central? Yeah. Oh, okay. 75, 75 quid for the set. You can use them in the butcher if you want. I don't, because we've got enough knives in the butchery. Yeah. I just keep them in my vehicle. They're absolutely brilliant. Just well, a little touch with the steel, Never sharpened them yet. Yeah, yeah. You, you just said a hanging gralic. You like to do a hanging gralic on the fallow. Yeah. So does that mean on a row Chinese or a muntjac you won't? Or no, no. I I pref my preferred gralic would be a hanging gralic across the board. Yeah. Um, but more so, I'm quite fussy that I do it on fallow because it keeps them nice and clean. Yeah. You know, even if you bleed them, you, you, I want that, to, that gralic to come out nice and clean. Yeah. Um, row quite often, because um, what I tend to do with fallow, I only shoot them if I can get to them with a vehicle. Yeah. Um, so I can pick them up, take them to somewhere where I can set up a hanging gralic, and I'll, and I'll hang gralic. With row, um, sometimes I just do a field gralic where I can take out the intestines and that's great and then I can put them in a row sack or carry them back to the vehicle so I'm not too fussy um, but yeah hanging is the preferred um, but I don't like doing fallow on the floor if I can help it yeah and we, we probably should have said if we haven't already that you're you supply a lot of venison into pubs restaurants that's hotels that yeah. sort of yeah that. so you're you're probably at kind of the higher end of food standards than the most that would be fair to say. Uh, well, I wouldn't say the the most, but probably, yeah, we're at we're at a very high standard of what we yeah. do. We have to be, yeah, yeah. And bleeding your animals is all important. You've got to bleed them as quickly as you possibly can, whether they're head or neck or chest or whatever. Just get them bled. Yeah. You know, don't think because you chest shot it, it's lost loads of blood. So you don't need to. Yeah, you know it does yeah. make a big difference to the quality of the meat. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and you got to get your animals off the field as clean as you possibly can. Yeah. So you'll. That's you'll why I don't bother wasting time shooting fallow if if they're all going to get shitted up and you can't get them out. Just yeah. don't shoot them. Really. Yeah. Kind of. That's the way it's got to be. Why? Why struggle with the, those big beasts and get them all shitted up? That's true. You know. Get, I've got an off-road vehicle, quite uh, a Kubota buggy. You know, we use that quite often, so mm. we can get to most places anyway. But there are, we have got a few spots where it just they just don't go there. In fact, yeah. we don't even go there this time of year because we know we're not going to get stuff out. Mm. So. And of all your meat, well, I, I wouldn't even like to guess how many carcasses you're processing, shooting a year. What, where does it all end up? Are you sort of fifty percent into pubs, restaurants, or or hotels? Seventy percent of our trade would be wholesale trade. So um, 
restaurants, pubs, farm shops, although it's they're selling to the retail customer at the end, you know, we st we still consider those as a wholesaler because we're selling to them wholesale and they're selling it on to retailers. Uh, the other 30% would be direct retail, so either through our venison boxes or um, private orders for specific cuts, which we'll deliver or the customer will come and collect from us. And that's uh, that's four species as well, Chinese water deer, monk jack, roe and fallow. And do people specify? Or as in... What, the species? Can, yeah. Uh, some people do if they know their venison, others don't. Now we quite like to keep our uh, customers informed about what they are eating. Um, I, when I say that, I mean the species, how long it's been hung for, uh, which helps them. If they like it, we can supply something. If they, if they find it too strong, then we can supply them with something that hasn't been hung for quite so long, or we can yeah. get them to try different species. Because at the end of the day, we want them to be enjoying what they're eating. Mm. Um, so as long as they know what they've had or as long as you know what they've had yep. then you can counteract it whichever way it goes yep. they absolutely love it and you can put the same in again yep. or you can get them to try other stuff so uh, I think it's a lot to do with education when you're, when you're selling venison keep your customers informed about what it is what you're doing where it's come from yep. you know and be able to ask answer any questions honestly when they when they ask you. And what's your uh, your sort of length of hanging philosophy? Are you sort of a week or uh, two weeks? Fallow week to ten days. Ideally, ideally weeks perfect. Ten days is okay. Any more than that, you just start getting a little bit strong for the general consumer, the connoisseurs. You'll find with, and we know our customers quite well. So if we have to hang something for two weeks. And sometimes you do. We know where it can go. So you've got people who will say, I want a nice, strong fallow. And yeah, I've got some well. really nice chefs that can do their own butchery and they know their game. Yeah. And they'll say, I want it to hunt for two weeks. Really? Yeah. Just because it's so Or even one that will say, I want to hunt for three weeks. So we'll specifically hang fallow for them for three weeks. Wow, really? Yeah, because that's what his clientele is. They like the strong stuff, whatever he does with it. That's what he wants. So that's yeah. what he gets. Right. Yeah, and uh, as time goes on, you get to know what your clients want, and that I think that's a must as well. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And funny you should say that we've just started uh, labelling some of our haunches with specific cuts that go into the retail farm shops, i.e., mm. monk jack haunch, monk jack loins, mm. row loins, row haunches. Um, the dice to the mince is um, we don't do it on the dice to the mince because it can be a couple of species. Yeah, because um, it's yeah, that kind of product. Um, but yeah, very just growing with our customers and, and trying to supply their needs on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. And the other thing as well, you've got to have deer in front of you all the time. You've got to commit to those orders. When your regulars pick up the phone and they want it, you, you have to have it. Yeah. Yeah. So you're out a lot of the time. We, Is are, it we are allowed a lot of time. We've got a network of. Um, you know, I don't shoot every single deer, of course I don't. So we've got stalkers that we work with, uh, that we've got land, we've got land, um, they'll stalk with us, they're still within our hunting group, um, but we've got people out there all the time. Yeah. We have to. Yeah, absolutely. Got, the got to supply the demand. And then, of course, you get some situations where you, you've got too much venison, so yes, we do freeze it. Um, but it's all got a use because we have got customers that don't mind frozen, yeah. mm. you know, particularly frozen haunches and frozen lawns because they know what they can do with it. Yeah. So it's I'm conscious we've been rabbiting on for quite a long time now and we've, we've probably lost 90% of uh, uh, the audience unless they're real committed kind of deer enthusiasts. But I, before we end, I'm, I'm not going to let you get away. You, you've been nominated, well, whilst we're talking about venison, you've been nominated recently for a, an award, haven't you, Jason? Well, we, uh, the time. business was nominated for the Eat Game Awards, uh, specifically yeah. for our venison, pork and apple sausages, which we're delighted about. Yeah. So we did. We got nominated and then we got through to the voting stage, and uh, which I believe today was the last day of voting. So 
We're just tentatively waiting to see if we've progressed any further. We'd be over the moon if we did. Um, yeah. But again, it's good for the industry. That, yeah. uh, you yeah. know, E-game is, is out there. It's a part of Bass. It's promoting game food, and I think it's doing a wonderful job. Um, and there's all sorts of awards across the industry. Uh, supermarkets, small producers, um, which is great. So, yeah, bring it on. If we, if we get to the... Glitzy awards ceremony, happy days. If not, we're just going to continue with um, selling high quality venison, keeping the landowners happy. Um, yeah, doing doing what we do because we love it. Yeah, we enjoy it. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Justin, for um, agreeing to come on the podcast. I think if it's been interesting for our um, audience I think me and Tom certainly have learnt a lot yeah, absolutely absolute pleasure Yeah. when's the next one well, oh, you might be too rich and famous for us by then once you've <laughs> <laughs> you know, won your wild game award yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah but um, if not we'll uh, we'll catch you on the next one okay thank, thank you very, very much listening. thank you